In December 2006, Joanna Garten, this evening's guest, received a phone call from her mom that in retrospect was more important than she ever could have imagined at the time. Her mom on the call talked about a girl named Christine Bosco, who graduated from the same high school as Joanna in Appleton, Wisconsin three years earlier. Christine played on the same tennis team. She hung out in the same malls and even learned to ski on the same slopes. But Joanna and Christine never crossed paths. Christine, it turns out, after college, left her Wisconsin life behind, became a world-class mountaineer, then disappeared with her climbing partner on a mountain in a remote area of Northwest China called Chengdu. After learning of her disappearance, Joanna's mom attended Christine's memorial service back in Wisconsin and got to know her mother. Captivated by this mystery, she decided to begin work on a book about Christine, a woman so humble that her extraordinary mountaineering career was known to the climbing community worldwide, but she was virtually unknown in her own hometown. Joanna felt her mom's fervor for telling Christine's story. Her research on the book project consumed every waking moment as she balanced the demands of her day job with the book. And by 2010, she was fully retired and ready to start writing it. Until one of her daughters noticed a tremor in her mom's left hand. Diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, it had stolen her handwriting ability. She could not write the book but did the next best thing that any mom would do. She handed the baton to her daughter, Joanna, already a published author, who years later poured over her mom's work and decided to climb the proverbial mountain and write the book. It was emotional, it was exhausting, and it was inspiring. While Joanna's recently published book called Edge of the Map is about Christine Boscoff, one of America's most accomplished female alpinists. The book is about the author's transformation, what she learned about Christine, but more important, what she learned about herself. Welcome to A Climb to the Top, Stories of Transformation on Talk Radio 77 WABC. My guest this evening is Joanna Garten. Joanna, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Chuck. I'm so excited to be here. It is a real pleasure. This story that I narrated, I feel belongs to three people. It belongs to you, it belongs to Christine, and it belongs to your mom. Do I have that right? That's absolutely correct. Those three women and how their lives intersect and were woven together is really the heart of the story. But before we get to your background, I just wanna to touch on, uh, on the book itself. Please recite it for our audience, even though I'm gonna put it up on there for those that are watching on YouTube. Tell us the name of the book, tell us who you wrote the book for. The name of the book is Edge of the Map, The Mountain Life of Christine Boscoff. And I wrote it for primarily, well, two specific people. The book is dedicated to my mother and Joyce Feld, who was Christine's mom. She is still with us mm -hmm. at age 95. But I also really wrote it for armchair climbers. Mountaineers, I think, of course, will love the book. But I really wrote it for people who are armchair warriors, armchair adventurers, who love stories of adventure, but have really no desire to go out and climb Mount Everest themselves. <laughs> okay, indeed. Well, let's get to your background because you and I do share something in common. So let's take us back to college and where you went to school. What did you study and what did you do from there? Okay. So I grew up in Wisconsin and I went to school at Syracuse University, mm -hmm. which we have in common, I believe. We are fellow <laughs> alums. My bride is also a Newhouse grad. Uh, 
school? Yes, yes, go Orange. So I studied broadcast journalism with a focus on sports journalism. And this was in the late 80s, early 90s. So there weren't a lot of women studying sports journalism at that time, but it was my passion and my love. And so I dove in. Uh, after college, I lived abroad for a few years. I had kind of gotten the travel bug during college and I lived abroad in Asia and learned how to speak Chinese and eventually came back to the United States, went to law school, practiced law for a very short period of time, and then began a career uh, as a college professor. I raised a family and eventually fell into writing. Uh, I wrote quite a bit during a year over in China. I moved my family to China when our two kids were quite little, and that turned into my first book, which then led to the second book. Well, it's interesting that you had been to China earlier in your life. You, your children, you lived with them in China, and here we are writing the book, which took place in the western edges of China, at the edge of the map, which is a reference to the book. Let's get to that, because I think as I read the book, I was wondering what you must have gone through to compile all of these pieces. So let's give the readers some context about when your mom called and explained this individual that surprisingly you didn't know, what were you thinking as she was telling you about, there's an interesting story here and let me share it with you. Yes, yes, there was a really interesting backstory. So as you mentioned in the intro, in December, 2006, I received this phone call from my mom and at the time I was living in Denver, my son, Will, had recently been adopted from China near the area where a pair of climbers were missing. And so my mom called because she had read about this pair of climbers missing in China. And their names were Charlie Fowler and Christine Boscoff. They were very accomplished. They lived near Telluride. And so my mother continued sort of talking about Chris's incredible rise in the sport of mountaineering and how she was the only female to own a major guiding company and on and on. And in the process, Chris had scaled more 8,000 meter peaks than any other American woman. And she was very fascinated by this story. And I stopped her at one point in this call, during this call, and I said, but mom, what is it about the story that's so fascinating to you? Because you're not a climber or a mountaineer. And she said, honey, you went to high school with her. And that was the moment that really did sort of change the trajectory of my mother's life and of mine. Was the name even familiar to you? The name was not familiar. I was not a mountaineer, nor I was a climber, but the bigger and more compelling reason I came to learn that I didn't know her name was because she was wrapped in humility. She was from the Midwest and incredibly humble. She wanted to be very much under the radar and just do this thing that she loved and not be recognized for her gender, but only for her accomplishments, but wanted to do so very quietly. Yeah, and the mountaineer in me through all of my years, I've been climbing for 18 years and she was legendary. We all knew who she was. And when I read your book and, and there was no notion of who she was in Appleton, Wisconsin, in her hometown, mm -hmm. I said, how could this be? How could someone go out there and do these extraordinary things? And maybe it was that humility. Did that draw you to the story, irrespective of your mom's situation? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I definitely recognized a lot of myself in those moments because I, too, had come through a system in college, trained as a sports journalist, which was a field that had very few women. And I very much got attention because I was a woman in that field. In addition, the same thing happened in law school. I was you know, definitely in the minority being in law school in the early 90s. So I recognized that theme in her life of just kind of wanting to do the thing you love and be recognized just for what you're doing and not because of um, your gender. So. And before your mom made the conscious decision that I cannot write this, were you continually drawn to the point that, yeah, I'll consider writing it, mom? Or did you dismiss it? Walk us through what you were feeling in your head, because now I want to get to the transformative moment that you actually decided to do it. But was it just that simple? Right. So at the time, my mom 
uh, decided that she could no longer continue. She had been diagnosed with Parkinson's, I think for about, I think it had been about five or six years and it just became apparent that she'd no longer be able to do her research. She hadn't actually started writing the book. She'd just done a metric ton of research. And I had just finished my first book, which kind of chronicled this year living in China with my family. And I wasn't necessarily dying to get a new book in my lap right away because I was busy with kids and life and on and on and on. But I approached my mom about maybe helping her. And at that point, we didn't know what that would look like. And she was interested. She had a very different vision about what the book could be than I think what I was thinking it might be. So that was a little bit hard to navigate. But over the course of a few months, she gradually handed it over to me until one day she literally handed me like seven boxes of her research. And I took them and I drove from Wisconsin to Colorado with all of her research. And that was the beginning. And was the investigative journalist in you, the individual that was, yeah, was, was going through these things? Like, what do we have here? Yes, what, absolutely. What was Yes, absolutely. I mean, it really did take me full circle then back to sports journalism, which I hadn't been practicing for 25 years because I had been mothering and lawyering and traveling and living abroad and on and on. And then I got to this moment where I realized, I think I'm about to write a book that's a mountaineering narrative. And now I'm back to my journalism roots. And it was so unbelievably peaceful and wonderful and exhilarating. And then I just dove in as far as you can possibly dive. I want to recount something from the book, the author in you and what you felt as you were either writing the book or you were uncovering what Christine was feeling on the mountains. The mountaineer in me knows as we are ascending a higher elevation, it's always freezing and we're nauseous a lot of the time and we're hungry and we're tired. As I was reading the book, you began to feel Christine how, how did that happen? I began to see, as I've already sort of alluded to, I began to see the parallels in our lives. I mean, she made these choices in her life, which were not conventional. And I had made a lot of very similar choices. She had initially intended to go to school to study nursing. And at the last minute, she decided to study aerospace engineering. I was one of the only women studying sports journalism in the late 80s in college. She had been on this quest to climb all of the world's 8,000 meter peaks. And then she took a massive U-turn and decided to really focus on unexplored peaks. And everybody thought she was crazy. I had made the decision with my husband to create our family by adoption at a time when everybody around us was pregnant. We consciously chose adoption to create our family. That was different and not conventional. Right. She had climbed the highest peaks in the world and everybody told her she was crazy. I moved my family to a communist country. Also, people told me I was crazy. So it just kind of kept unraveling such that I really recognized these parallel journeys that we'd been on. Yet the children, you, your, your, your children, you mentioned them in the book, it's Will and Eden. Mm -hmm. Are they both born in China? They are. Yes, my son Will was born very close to where Chris perished. Mm -hmm. And my, um, my daughter Eden was also born in China. They're both adopted from China. Yeah, so there's something here in the air that is heaven sent. But what I wanted to get to before is you knew when Christine was feeling cold, you were cold. When Christine was feeling tired, you were tired. It's as if she just went right through you and you felt how she felt. She became a part of you, did she not? That's how I felt reading it. Yes, yes, absolutely. There were moments when I was writing the book and I would be writing passages where she was on top of Everest, mm -hmm. experiencing cold, and I would realize that I was literally shivering as I was writing the book. Mm -hmm. So those sorts of moments happened throughout the writing process. So by the end of the book, and writing the book and that first manuscript being done, I felt very strongly that we had a kinship, almost a sisterhood. Right. And yet you've never met. So now you're writing her story. You're listening to A Climb to the Top. 
on Talk Radio 77 WABC. I'm Chuck Garcia. My guest this evening is Joanna Garten. One thing to our listeners, when we sign off on ABC tonight, please switch to my YouTube channel. You can find that by just Googling Chuck Garcia in YouTube and we will have the full story. What we're gonna talk about in this part of the story is Joanna's transformation. And then if you hang on and you switch to the YouTube channel, the full episode will go deeper on the book. I loved this book and I know every inch of it. So we're gonna take it to a deeper level on the second one, but I don't wanna lose focus on this. So walk our listeners through. You, you didn't need more to do. Here you were in your life raising children, marriage. You know, I know that you also dedicate yourself to coaching uh, children. You're a runner yourself and a marathoner. How can you do all of this? How did you do it? I just felt with a fervor that I was meant to tell the story. And so I think when you find that passion in your life, whatever it might look like, and we probably will talk about this a little bit more at the end, you grab a hold of it and you don't let go. And that's always what I've tried to do in my life. And it wasn't until I was researching Chris's story that I realized she also did that. Right. And so I grabbed at this project, mm -hmm. dove in and realized that it was really life-giving and it fed me every day, in addition to parenting and coaching and all the other things that I was being fed by. Mm -hmm. Being a storyteller and a journalist, and telling this particular story, I felt very strongly was something that I was meant to do. Indeed. So as you were uncovering it, walk us through how the book actually came to life. Oh my goodness. In terms of the research itself or in terms of kind of putting it together? Well, what we knew is you had seven boxes. That's about mm -hmm. as much as you had. You had the ability to Google Christine Boscoff. You could get mm -hmm. her backstory on Wikipedia and there's, there's no lack of material. But that doesn't make a book, and an author still has to figure out an approach. Right. So as right. you're taking out these boxes, did you know the story you were going to tell from the research, or did it evolve along the way? It was an evolution, for sure. My mother had intended to write a biography, very much a traditional biography of Christine. Okay. And as I started getting into it, you know, I had a list of maybe... 20 people that she had interviewed. And as I started getting into it and calling those people and hearing more and more about her life and the interesting people that crossed her path, I realized this could be so much more than a traditional biography, that it was more a work of creative nonfiction, very similar to Into Thin Air, which is a book that it's now being compared to, Indeed. where you have this incredible adventure story and so as I started digging into it and researching and also reading other mountaineering narratives, I began to realize that there really was nothing else like it that existed. There was no adventure story that had been written about an American female mountaineer. And so at that point, I got super excited and I set out to write a story that could appeal not just to mountaineers, as I've mentioned, but to non-climbers as well. And that could kind of bring them into the world of mountaineering and help them understand what it is that drives mountaineers and climbers and give them a peek at Sherpa life and help them understand the physiology of climbing at high altitude and how people put together these big expeditions. All of those things were so fascinating to me that at times I very much fell down what I call rabbit holes and I would go off for a week at a time into different areas of research until I finally sort of had to ground myself and say, okay, now what parts are most important and what do I want to include? And that's how I ended up with the book that I did. Definitely. And, and I, and Into Thin Air was the book that unleashed the beast in me. And while it's certainly a fair comparison, they have two things in common. The Into Thin Air, Crack Hours book in yours, it was instructional. I learned a lot. Even the, the, the experienced mountaineer in me, there were things I was learning along the way that you were dropping in. But most what appealed to me as the reader, this was a mystery. What mm -hmm. happened to Christine? Is, right. were, were you writing the mystery? Was that the thing you were writing as you instructed us along the way? Is that what you were going for? Yes, yes. The mystery of Chris and Charlie's disappearance was definitely the crescendo. And that does consume the last, I'd say the last quarter of the book. Because it's so 
incredibly compelling. They had not left many details about where they were going to be climbing. They hadn't gotten climbing permits. They climbed in this really unexplored area. And so when they literally didn't arrive on their flight home, this massive search and rescue ensued. And that story, the search, uh, the story of the search and rescue, I felt was so worth telling and hadn't been told. So that's definitely where I was headed. Walk us through how you felt in these fragments. Did you give up? Did you ever, well, you obviously didn't. Did you feel like, I don't have enough. I, how, how can I write a book? Help, mm -hmm. help the next budding author who may be in a position like this understand what you were feeling. Right. Okay. Well, I think the greatest thing that I did during that time, and the thing that I'm pretty good at, is listening. So I started these conversations with people who had known and loved Charlie and Chris. And because there was no book about Charlie nor Chris, people were really anxious for the story to be told because it is such a beautiful and inspiring story. And so people really unloaded. And at the end of conversations, they would say, well, you should talk to these two additional people. Until my Rolodex was like, I had talked to a hundred people and it was exhausting and time consuming, but I wanted to be listening and listening and listening so I could understand the story much better. And along the way, I developed champions for the story who I brought on board because I couldn't do this all by myself. So eventually I had kind of an inner circle of four to 10 people who I really counted on when I was feeling frustrated with where I was going with the writing or I was stuck or at a dead end or when I was completely emotional about what I was writing because there were very powerful sections that I had to write through and go right through those experiences. And so developing champions was something I did along the way. And did you, as you wrote, Stay in that emotional zone, or did you have to become dispassionate just so you could move it on? I wanted to be dispassionate, <laughs> but it was <laughs> but it wasn't so easy. impossible. <laughs> yes, of course, because I thought I'm a very serious journalist. I for sure will not get attached to these people, especially because so many of them have passed. And I got so very deeply attached to these characters, I call them, although they were real living people that every time I would have to sort of write a scene in which somebody died, I would be in bed for the rest of the afternoon, just kind of crying. And I had to do that. I had to go through that experience as opposed to around that. So were you writing it along the way and as information was revealed to you, you kept writing or were there, was it written in intervals based on research that had come into your lap? I wrote about one third of it and then I went to China. And I went to China because I wanted to walk the path that Christine had walked with Charlie on that last expedition. Right. And I'm so glad that I did that because that helped me, it helped fuel me for the rest of the book. Uh, and so after that trip, I was able to write the last two thirds of the book pretty rapidly. And for context, can you explain just briefly how that they thought it was going to be a rescue and recover. They didn't know exactly what it was. We'll get deeper in the book when we switch to the YouTube channel. I think this is an important part of the journalist in you trying to figure out how this mystery got unraveled. Explain the story of how they were found. Spoilers, Chuck. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I can do that. So... It involved a coordinated search and rescue effort between people in Mount, at uh, Mountain Madness, which was the guiding company that Christine owned out in Seattle, friends of Chris and Charlie in Telluride, and then also officials in China. And so over the course of about three weeks, these three teams pieced it together. And it was really like finding a needle in a haystack until they targeted that mountain that Chris and Charlie were attempting to summit and they eventually located their bodies. Right, let's leave it there. I don't want to give anything more away because here's an interesting one. I felt as I read it, it was a bit like Apollo 13. I knew how the story ended, but I couldn't put it down mm -hmm. because I was much more interested, not in the conclusion, which anyone would have known. It was much more compelling understanding as I was following your journalistic nose what it actually came to be. Okay, now the book has been written. When was it released? It was released April 1st, 2020.
All right, now what has been the reaction either in the climbing community or outside the climbing community? Oh my goodness, the reaction has been unbelievable and positive and overwhelming. And it's one of those books that's really moved people in so many different ways. Um, and so many different types of readers are picking it up and finding different places to fall in love with it. So it's been super rewarding. It has mm -hmm. indeed. Now, when you reflect on, or when you closed the book, is this the book you intended to write? Yes, I think it is. I think it is, though I didn't know what it was going to look like when I started. But by the time I had come back from China, I knew what I wanted to write, and I think I did it. The title of the book is a reference to what someone had said about Christine. Mm -hmm. Explain that, because I think it's a really cool origin when somebody picks it up. Yes, the origin of the title? Yes. Yes, yes. So during the search and rescue effort, uh, the Seattle search and rescue team was very hunkered down and very frustrated because again, Chris and Charlie hadn't left details on where they were going. And there's a scene in the book that's obviously real because the book is a work of creative nonfiction. And one individual says to the other, I'm so frustrated, we can't find them. Why can we not find Chris and Charlie? And the response is, because Chris didn't just go climb mountains, she went to the edge of the map. She went to the edge of the map, and that was such a beautiful part of it, because when we think of mountaineering, to our audience, you know about the seven summits, that in each continent, you have the highest peak, and they tend to get the most attention, but I think Christine, as part of her humility, while she certainly climbed some of the famous ones, including K2, mm -hmm. she, that's not what she was going for. This was intrinsic. This yes. was, her life story was not about seeking fame on the mountains. It was about doing the thing that she loved. Mm -hmm. In the time that we have remaining here on 77 WABC, before we switch over to YouTube, please relate to our audience. If they're ever, if they find themselves in a situation like this with a phone call that changes everything, what do you want them to think, feel, and do about the capacity to act on something that is speaking to you? Mm -hmm. Oh, I love this question. And I love that you end here. So I think what I want them to take away, both from my story and from Christine's story, is I would love for them to imagine a thing or an experience that they're having in their daily life that they can't live without. And it looks different for everybody. Maybe it's yodeling or pickleball or writing or parenting or traveling. And I think I have found it very easy to get to this point where I have these passions and then all of a sudden have a moment of panic and look outward and think about, well, is everybody else kind of doing this as well? And so what I would like listeners to take away is at that moment, look inward for those things that move you. You already have the answers to your passions and the big questions in your life within you. So spend time looking within as a to looking outside yourself slow yeah. down long enough yeah i appreciate that because sometimes part of the theme of this show sometimes we choose the mountains sometimes the mountains choose us and i think in this case what i loved is about it your mom had a mountain the mountain chose you in in the nexus of these circumstances it was so natural your background your hometown China, you had all of these elements talking to you. And if ever you doubt the existence of a higher power, this lovely story brings it all together. And I would encourage all of our listeners to go read this wonderful book called Edge of the Map by Johanna Garten. Um, to our listeners, thank you as always for tuning in to Talk Radio 77 WABC on the climb to the top stories of transformation. And for those of you that are listening that are switching to our YouTube channel, just go on Google, Chuck Garcia YouTube. All, all, always thanking you for coming in and listening to us. You can communicate with me at chuckgarcia.com. Just hit the contact button, send me a note. You can also send an email to chuck at climbleadership.com. That's chuck at climbleadership.com. 
tell us how you feel about the show. And if you have anyone that you think would like to be on the show, we're always welcome to hear our new guests. So thank you very much. And Joanna, for the ABC portion, thank you for coming on. Thanks so much for having me. All right. So what we're going to do, we're going to stay on the YouTube channel, and we are going to talk about the book. So to our listeners who are now on YouTube, you have a visual into this as I held it up. Here is the book. And when I read the book, I, there, there was something striking about Joanna's style. So let's talk about that. You started the book in China, but you then brought it back to home life in Appleton, Wisconsin. Why did you choose that approach, which I incidentally adored? But you had to I pick think, a direction. Why that? Yeah, yeah. You sort of have to pick a place to start. And, you know, as a writer, I knew that I needed a hook. So that's a very obvious place to start. I start in the middle of this really frantic search and rescue. But I also, as a reader, I'm like you. I love kind of flashbacky sequencing in books. And I, I like it, but I don't like it when it's overdone. And so I didn't want to start at the search and rescue. And then I flash all the way back to Chris's youth. And then we pick up at the search and rescue about two thirds of the way through the book. And we take it all the way to the end, so. And tell us, what did you learn about Chris along the way? Even though you never crossed paths, didn't know who she was, you now have a box with this person that you, you walked the same halls, you played on the same court, you worshiped in the same church. Who was she? What did you find out about her? Yeah, I, I found out that she was a regular girl. <laughs> <laughs> right, Which Midwest was, blonde, yes. athletic. Smart, all of the yes, involved. yes, you know, and that was so fascinating for me to just find out that she was a regular person because I think when you encounter these individuals who are doing what appear to be these superhuman things, climbing the top of eight thousand meter peaks, you think there must be some magic or something special, or that they never have faults, or that they never have insecurities. And so I had access to her journals and I was able to read her journals nice. and see all her beautiful, messy insecurities that we all have. And so it was very important for me to incorporate that into the narrative because I felt like that made her more relatable. Yeah. And as I talk to readers now, that's one of the things I discuss with them, that this actually became kind of a difficult thing with one of my editors because they felt this particular ed editor wanted to take that out. There were a few things that showed her insecurities. Oh, no. Said, no please, please let me leave those in. And so I did win that battle and I was happy about that. I really enjoyed reading about it if for no other reason. It had to be consistent with this humility that was mm -hmm. constantly on display. And if you didn't write something that was in the service of that humility, how would we have bought it? Because part of buying it was this insecurity that was out there, but not in a way that inhibited anything. It just made her real. And is that what you were going for? Yes, that was totally what I was going for. And I think this really was important to me because it was a work of nonfiction. I think you can create any character you want if you're writing a work of fiction, but I wanted that humility to come through and for people to know that it was real mm -hmm. and that she was no different than any of us, especially my readers who are women. Indeed. As you were writing this creative nonfiction, there, there is dialogue here, which you, to the best of your knowledge, had wrote something. How did you do that as a writer? Right, that's a good question. So most of the dialogue and the scenes, I call them scenes, where there's dialogue, I was able to speak to someone who is still living, who was able to describe that scene to me. So that's what I would consider a first person account. And I felt very comfortable with that, but even still, I would run those scenes past that person to make sure that I got it absolutely as close to authentic as it possibly could be. Right. And then there were about three scenes where there were people in the scenes who were no longer living. And in those cases, I had to use lots of research, newspaper articles, videos. Sometimes Chris had described that moment to somebody else, and then I would talk to that person and it was arduous to do that, but I was, you know, I'm a journalist, so I very much wanted to get all of that right. Well, I felt as, as 
chapter to chapter, like just what an immense amount of work it was, not just to write a wonderful book, but the fragments. It must have been hundreds of names and places. How did you keep it all straight? Mm -hmm. So I had lots of sleepless nights. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't always easy, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yes. I had that image that we sometimes have of somebody laying in bed and just a million different things swirling around in your head. Right. And you're trying to kind of pick the pieces out and put the puzzle together. Right. And so I had a lot of that. And then I had a lot of huge giant stickies on the wall. If we're mm -hmm. talking about like actual logistics of how I did it, uh, lots of le like poster sized stickies and arrows and colored pens and whatnot, because I'm a visual person. Right. And then I was always very flexible. And so as I was starting to write, I was okay if I suddenly wanted to go into a different direction. And were you writing and rewriting and going over the same space or were you constantly pushing forward up the mountain? I was constantly pushing forward up the mountain. That's how I write. Everybody does it different and that's how right. I do it. You know, that's why I ask because what I know is as authors also, I know my book, it was deemed finished when there was nothing left to take away. You know, we wrote this much with my editor and then we started, how did it work for you? Did you have this much that you pared down? Mm -hmm. So I had, I want to say about 80,000 words when I was all said and done. And then I got my first editor who was called a developmental editor whose job it was to look at the characters and the scope and the arc and help me kind of make sure that I was telling the story I wanted to tell. And she and I got it down to about 75,000 words, 70,000 words. So we actually didn't have to cut very much. I write very concisely. Yeah. I don't tend to write dry, heavy. I don't tend to use big words. I write pretty short chapters. And so it ended up not being snipped and cut quite as, well, um, as I expected it might be. And I was happy about that. You do. You have a journalistic flair. And John Krakauer, when he wrote Into Thin Air, I had read him when I used to read the book or the read, read the magazine, the climate magazines. And he, mm -hmm. he was always an editor to do it. There's a certain stylist that journalists tend to write in. You wrote in a, that Hemingway-ish, very quick, easy, accessible way because as you were narrating the story, it was a very easy thing to just follow. There wasn't, in spite of all of these things out there, I really appreciated the simplicity of how you kept that storyline just coming along. Is that, were you born with that or did you learn that along the way? I think a little of both. I love to read that as a reader. And so because that's the type of book I love to read, I think that's naturally how I've gravitated as a writer. Uh, but definitely some of that is learned as a journalist to be very concise and to be writing newspaper articles when you have to get kind of this pyramid style. I think that came into play as well. Now I wanna get jump out of the book a little bit. And we learned a lot about Christine in the book but I felt like I learned a lot about you and I've gotten to know you over these prep calls and all. Mm -hmm. What did you learn about yourself? As oh my goodness. You going through all of this, because this is your transformation. Yes. Your, your story. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I've talked a little bit about this already, but I can elaborate. So I think yeah. the biggest thing I learned through this process is to have more faith in the things that I'm passionate about and that inner voice. Right, good. I think especially in this day and age, I can get very caught up in looking beyond myself and see what everybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. And if that's not something that I'm doing or pursuing, should I be? And that's not helpful at all for me, for society, for anybody, for my family. So that's, I think, the biggest takeaway for myself is to pay more attention to the things that I'm doing in my own life right. that I love and to follow those no matter what. Right. No, I ask that because many of the people who speak on the show talk about this counterproductive nature of not listening to the inner voice and seeing what the market wants, what the world wants. And sometimes the inner voice is telling you something, and yet our natural tendency is often to resist it. Because you didn't need a reason to write this book because you had plenty to do already. Mm -hmm. But your inner voice commanded it, so to speak. 
Yes. Yes. It got to the point where I couldn't imagine not doing it. It was just something that I absolutely had to do. And I couldn't imagine a life completed in which I hadn't finished this book. Now, give us a timeline. From the time that phone call came to the next jump where, okay, it's a go, to we're now researching and you're paying attention, walk us through that. And then right up to publication. Yes. So Christine and Charlie disappeared in December 2006. And so that's when that little article was published in our hometown newspaper. And when I got the call from my mother, mom worked on the book for about 10 or 11 years. She had a full-time job, but she was doing this at nights and on the weekends. So in about 2017 is when she turned over those boxes of research to me. And then it took about two and a half years, three years, for the work to be completed and for the book to be published, which is pretty quick, I think, actually. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, it's, everybody has their own rate at which they decide they want to write it, but I'd imagine yours was more complicated because of the extensive nature of the unknowns. That's part of the love of research. You don't expect it to be in front of you, mm-hmm. but you had a much greater challenge on your hand because if it's a creative work of nonfiction, you actually had to create something that we had to buy in and believe, even though you were not on the mountain to hear the discussions, you created a lot of dialogue. How challenging was that? Were were you doubting yourself or were you just going with it? I wasn't doubting myself because I had so many people supporting me and going over every sentence of what I was writing. All of those champions that I've mentioned kind of wrapped their arms around this project. And so as I would try to recreate scenes and even write those scenes where people were still living, I was going through this very arduous process of sending them those scenes and saying, was the backpack yellow or was it blue? Oh goodness, are you sure you were eating pizza in this scene and not a hamburger? And I mean, it was just on and on and on. So it took forever, but I always felt really confident that I was doing it just right. Right. And you must have felt good as you had a grasp of each and every detail that almost gave you your own permission to move on. So they got it, move on to the next one. There was never any doubt you could continue to ascend. Mm -hmm. Okay. So to, to, to know that your book was a joint effort among a whole lot of people, what did it feel like when you went to China for this portion of the project and you're staring at this monastery that is mentioned in the book and you're in this beautiful place. It, you weren't sightseeing. Oh my gosh. No, I was not sightseeing. It was one of the most transformative experiences of my life to be there as a journalist and as a woman and as a storyteller t- to be in that space at this monastery and speaking with these really incredible Tibetan Buddhist monks who had known Chris and Charlie because Chris and Charlie had stopped at this monastery before that last descent. And it was emotional and beautiful. I spent three or four days there and actually climbed to the spot where Chris's body was found. And that particular day was just hard to even explain, really. Um, Just so pivotal in my writing this book that... um, I'm so grateful that I had the chance to go there because I do think it makes the story quite special to know that the author has actually been there and walked in those spaces. Well, as the reader, you put us in the scene because this was your, your boots were on that ground. And I think it helped me to really relate to, we were seeing this through your eyes. This wasn't somebody else's, it was yours. And it made the book really authentic. Um, so to, to those of you who are listening, even if you are not a climber. I think the book was instructional. It was inspirational. But I think to me, it was inspiring in that it took these things that nobody really knew about and had someone lead the ability to write a story that had to be told. And who better than you, Joanna, to write it for all of the elements that came full circle right back to Appleton, Wisconsin, where the two moms, the real anchors of this story, your mom, Chris's mom, 
here they got to know each other. Describe that. They did. Oh my goodness. Yes. Yeah, so this is really special. So they did get to know each other. At the time when Chris was missing, she, my mom reached out to Christine's mom, which is something you do in the Midwest. You reach out, you bring a casserole, on and on and on. And it's a small town in Wisconsin. Right. <laughs> right. And the two women really forged this lovely friendship in those months when Chris and Charlie's bodies were not yet found and had not yet been recovered. And so by the time Chris's ashes were brought back to Appleton, which was a good 10 months after she had died, my mom was convinced that the story needed to be told. And so then over the course of 10 years, she spent lots of time with Christine's mom and they're still friends to this day, which is so very sweet. That's a wonderful thing. Now let's help our listeners and viewers find your book. First, find you. Where's the best place to contact you? The best place is my website, which is joannagarten.com. My name has an H, J-O-H-A-N-N-A-G-A-R-T-O-N.com. And you can find me there. You can email me there. You can buy the book there. That's where I am. Right. Um, I want to thank you, Joanna, for, for one, for writing an absolutely wonderful book. It was a joy to read every word, every chapter. I loved it. Second, you and I have a couple people in common. I climbed a few mountains with a company called Mountain Madness. To our listeners, Christine was actually president of Mountain Madness. And I want to mention Martin Logson, who I had the pleasure of climbing with his organization twice, brought you into my life. And Mark, if you are listening, I thank you for bringing us together because this has been a wonderful journey as the radio host, but as the reader, as the mountaineer, Joanna, you delivered a job. Um, I, I think now the most important question, what now? What, what, what are you doing? Is it all edge of the map or is there something else you're doing? Oh my goodness. Okay, so what now? So <laughs> I'm in a little bit of a different place than I thought I would be because I released the book in the middle of the pandemic, actually at the beginning of the pandemic. So. My book tour was canceled. The I've had to make a complete pivot with marketing and whatnot and on and on and on. So I'm spending probably the rest of this year working on Edge because I'm so passionate about getting her story out into the world. So I'll be doing all sorts of Edge promotion until the end of the year. And I'm definitely talking to people in the film and TV industry because I think it would make a fabulous movie or film or miniseries or whatnot. So that's hopefully also on the horizon. And I'm collecting stories because I think I've got another book in me and I just don't know what that subject is yet. I wonder what it is, but I would love to see this turned into a film. And I'm, I'm feeling with you on that one. You, know, you and I have a lot in common in that we appreciate the different medias by which stories can be told. And your, your story, your Christine's story is right for a film. So I hope it does get produced. But the important thing is thank you for writing the book Thank you for coming on to the show. And thank you for making a wonderful contribution to the mountain. Thank you so much, Chuck. It's been so great to be with you. It's been a real pleasure. So thank you and to our listeners. Good night, Joanna. Joanna, stay on. I'm going to keep you on for the, for, for, uh, we'll edit this out in just a second. But to our listeners, thank you so much as always coming for coming in. Please put your comments in. Send us an email. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much.